Uh, now we will start uh, session three of the symposium. My name is Hiroaki Takashima, a program civic professor at the GSS of this school. I will be in charge of this session three. Uh, all the participants, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining the session three and welcome back. Uh, this uh, session three is entitled uh, For Future of Human Survivability Studies. Uh, in this session, uh, for our graduate students studying in the five-year doctoral programs at GSIS, we will present uh, each research and practical activity. Then, uh, three of uh, GSIS professors will make their summary comment of uh, this symposium. Today's uh, symposium is a part of a series of GSIS International Symposium, which has been held every year since the establishment of GSIS in 2013, focusing on the global issues uh, that the human survivability studies are tackling. As you heard, uh, this year's International Symposium is held under the theme of the habitability in the post-Anthropocene. We have recent very exciting uh, discussions on the Anthropocene and the post-Anthropocene and also in the very difficult time in the COVID-19. I found uh, the discussions expanded a lot and went go far away uh, beyond the uh, present world. Uh, this school, GSIS, is uh, pursuing human survivability. In this sense, uh, today's uh, discussions of session one and session two uh, gave us a very novel perspectives. The presentations of the four uh, students to be made do not necessarily take up the theme of Anthropocene or post-Anthropocene, but their report of research and the practice on the subject that each student focused on from among the many challenges that the global society will face in that age and in future. We hope that uh, this will be an opportunity for you all to know a part of our research and practical activities of the GSIS. From now on, due to the time constraints, uh, question, uh, your question and the comments uh, from the participants will be summarized at the end of the session after the student presentation and the faculty comments. So uh, if you have uh, any questions or comments, during the presentations, please write them in chat box. Then we will introduce the at the end of the session. Now, uh, let's start the student presentation. Uh, the first presenter is Mr. Tiago Shuva. He's an international student from Brazil and is currently enrolled in his second year. The title of the presentation is Overview of early phase intellectual property production in patents related to the COVID-19 pandemic. He seeks to see the needs for future technological progress for the fight against COVID-19 from the status of patent generation for the SARS and the COVID-19. So uh, uh, Mr. Tiago, are you ready to make a presentation? Yes, I will just share. Okay, my... then please start. So thank you, Professor Takashima, for the nice introduction. And thank you for allowing me to be here sharing a bit about my research today. Um, well, what I want to talk about is directly related to the pandemic we're seeing and actually in the tackle how to solve it. And as you know, we're not going to solve it without science, without research and without lots of investment. And then intellectual property will be one of the main tools in that sense. Well, as you know, there's no specific treatment or vaccine for COVID available now. Um, even for infection prevention, as long as we use masks, but masks are not 100% uh, assurance that you're not going to get the disease. So we have no ways to actually completely stop it. And for sure, all because of lockdowns and other economic measures, uh, there's a generalized economic crisis. And even though we've been trying to solve these issues, and as you can see in here, 
uh, the, there's a collapse in worldwide GDP and specifically with the second wave that's starting to grow in Europe and other countries, probably going to hit Japan, um, then the economic burden will be even higher. Well, intellectual property comes in the sense that the investment needed to do research and development, specifically in pharmaceutical and medical industries, is extremely high because those research take time, they take a lot of investment because this amount of research needed and amount of <laughs> in materials needed very high and there's a very high risk for such research. We don't know from beginning if a new vaccine or a new drug will work and there's, there must be a way to protect the res final result of that innovation and that where the intellectual property system comes. Well, it comes, it helps accelerating the recovery of investment in research and development. It generates profit either by licensing or by ensuring that the company have a period of exclusivity after commercialization. And for sure, this profit and this gain, financial gains, we allow the financing of developing new products. And that's exactly the moment we're living now. For example, with the vaccines or new drugs for coronavirus. Um, all the money that's coming from the companies come from uh, previous research they did, previous, previous drugs they're selling, previous vaccines they're producing, and they're all being concentrated in production of vaccines for COVID now. And as you can see, we are more or less know the different phases of vaccines, of uh, how to approve a vaccine. And the number of vaccines in development is very high, but takes a lot of time to finish all those phases. What we're doing now, it's almost a miracle, but we've tried to finish in one year. And this amount of investment is protected by the intellectual property system. Well, then what was my goal with this research? Actually, I want to see, considering the moment now, what are the patents related to SARS-CoV-2, to the virus that relates to COVID-19? And I wanted to do a technological prospection study, trying to see either the strategy of technological development by different countries, checking trends in topics related to the pandemics, to see what's coming new, what are the most promising uh, uh, technologies that are going to solve the disease, and who is doing that. How I did it. Uh, I used SpaceNet, which is the patent search and database from the European Patent Office. And I use it to descriptors, trying to be as specific as possible for the current situation, for current disease, using SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So any, what I re it returned it was any patent that mentioned specifically one of those terms. Well, I got 1,017 patents by that time. 58 of those were already repeated, considering the two descriptors. And in the end, I analyzed 659 patents. And then by qualified reading, I classified them in seven different uh, categories. Well, what I saw first, well, those categories, just to explain, although the patent system already have a, a classification method, it's not relevant for the context we're living in. So I decided to divide it in categories that are more related to the pandemic itself, like biotechnology, diagnostics, modeling, prevention, treatments, and vaccines. Those words actually we hear a lot and they're more relevant now considering the kind of developments we're doing. Then I could fit most patents in one of those categories. Well, what I saw first, <laughs> the number of patents by country, and out of those 659 patents, 74% of those came from China. Um, and a small number of other countries also appeared, like Spain, United States, Australia, and the other ones have really low amounts of innovations. Why China? And it's not only because the virus came from there, so the disease was identified there before, and thus 
innovations started to be produced earlier, considering the rest of the world. Uh, the first patents uh, filed in China were mounted to February, just two months after the, the disease was identified, even before it was a big thing in Europe, for example. But because China, there is used a lot of research already done for the first SARS cause for the SARS disease in 2002. Uh, most of the, as the viruses are very similar between each other, lots of innovations from that time could be used now again. And China has suffered the most by that time. They could you use a lot amount, a uh, high amount of those research. And also, as I'm going to comment later, because several companies in China are trying to showcase the research because they know that this opportunity is very important for them to show that their ability to do research and to protect their advancements now wouldn't be a smart decision for them. They hope that someone will see what they produce it and going to actually take it from them and then they can get some money out of it. I also analyzed the average analysis time. And as you can see, Although the average is around 130 days, that's basically because international patents filed in WIPO as United, and United States patents have a huge analysis time in days. Why? Actually, this it would be impossible because we had no COVID 850 days ago. But there are, actually, most of those United States patents are are recycled in the sense of claims in old patents were added. So it's actually patents that are already granted years ago, but now they got claims added about COVID and then those patents ended up counting in analysis time as longer. So there's mostly not new things coming out of the US because they're more conservative about it. Instead of China, they're trying to show more of their innovations. United States are trying to protect it as much as they can. Other countries you see around 40 days, and that's actually around the time used for anal analyzing the, a patent file in the first phase, just to see if it's a good patent or not, not granting it. Uh, and that's average uh, worldwide. So about 30 to 50 days, so that's expected. Well, considering the different categories, I could see that it's more or less equilibrated, uh, especially considered during the three of the diagnostics, treatments, and prevention, which are the hot topics right now about the combat of the disease. And if you analyze it by each country, we're going to see that countries like China, Russia, and the United States, they have a more diverse production of intellectual property so far, which is interesting because spe specifically biotechnology diagnosis vaccines are very high investment and high return, but it's expensive to do this kind of research, especially and show this kind of research so early it's not for everyone. So countries that are more uh, stable in this sense uh, would have an advantage. And other countries like South Korea, Spain, Germany, and even all the other smaller ones, they focus more on prevention, which are low cost patents, using uh, utility models like masks, barriers, or any kind of disinfection procedures. And those are one explanation for, for such results. And also, if you look by the other side, if you analyze these different uh, categories and which country dominates more of it, you actually see how China dominates in most of those areas. But in prevention, you have a participation of many more countries in that sense. Also for modeling, as those are more mathematical studies, then it doesn't require that much uh, investments and also more countries are also participating. But other areas, especially vaccines, you can see the Chinese domination. Well, what I consider so far, about the country's strategy, well, as I've mentioned before, the China strategy seems to be more open, trying to showcase their research. US, very few recent patents, 
lots of old uh, patents getting new claims, which is a quite conservative model, but also interesting. Spain has a huge focus on utility models, which accelerates the kind of battle they're having <laughs> against COVID and trying to get to action faster. And other countries are also more conservative. As I mentioned before, they're trying still to protect a little more of their, their innovations and they're going to see it in the future. Well, one thing that's important, this analysis does not take the quality of those innovations in count because those patents are filed, not granted. I would say it's quite early to consider this, but this will be a very interesting future work to see how much of those patents now that are filed very fastly in the beginning of the pandemics are actually going to be granted in the future and see if it actually be worth it. Well, in future research is actually keep doing this analysis, specifically after the end of the confidentiality period, which is generally 18 months. It changes country to country. Um, so we're going to see not only the, the patents that were published already, and that's a decision of the publisher, of the person who files the patent, uh, but we're going to see all of it. And that's going to start around February, March, and then you're going to see a boom on patents that mentions COVID. So that's going to be really interesting to compare the results we obtain now and the results we're going to see in the future. And that's it. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator. This is Gabriela Pazelli from the Federal University of Sao Paulo. And I'm open to discussions and you can contact me in any way you find next. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tiago. Uh, thank you for that. Then uh, the second uh, is uh, Ms. Hanakura. She's an international student from China and is also currently in her second year. The title of her presentation is uh, Mindful Living of Chinese Muslim from the viewpoint of Umma. How can people get peace of mind in modern society? Uh, she takes up the Islamic concept of Umma and uh, examines the case of Chinese Muslims. Uh, Ms. Hanakura, are you ready to make your presentation? Okay, please start. Well, um, thanks for the brief introduction and uh, it's an honor for me to be here to present my research and uh, the connection between it to the human survivability studies. So, um, firstly, I suppose that from February this year that most of us have changed the lifestyle to some degree. You, um, as you can see, a uh, mask is somehow turning into a daily clothing and talking with friends um, through internet no longer seems nerd or unsocial as well. However, it needs to be noted that although adaption to surviving through coronavirus situation seems to possess well so far, the negative thoughts or um, depression as a result of the isolation feeling is still a big deal. So um, from the viewpoint of post anthropocene time, in my opinion, challenges of this kind, which is relatively hard to be solved by only individuals, are certain to come up to the stage more than the old days. Um, so in order to respond to such threats, I strongly believe that in addition to technological prosperity, the same necessity is required to concentrate on the inner side of us. That is to say, how can we react to loneliness in a spontaneous way? Through what method can we be aware of our current position and relation to the outside media? How do we settle the identity into a harmony, especially when facing the soaring nationalism? Then I would say, above questions could be answered through a sense of belonging by sticking to a community no matter it is substantial or metaphysical. And then why is that? Let me take Chinese Muslims and their opinions upon a conception in the 20th century as an example. Well, it is said that by confirming the connection to a very concept, no matter if one lives inside or outside of the Islamic world or whatever ethnicity he or she was born into, 
all the Muslims could find themselves a place in the community, as well as maintaining their identity. So more specifically, this meta concept is called Wuma in Arabic, which originally means a universal community based on a common faith. In the last half of the 20th century, um, Wuma has been endowed um, as a proof to an imagined, com imagined community of so-called Islamic world, which is also one of the uh, continuous top topics in Islamic studies too. On the other hand, Wuma in China has been developing into a unique and interesting direction. That is, in construct to ending up in autonomous extremist activities or international conflicts. The Islamic revivalist movements in China are considered to be involved with not only religious causes, but also secular elements as well, which also accounts for the overall social and political harmony, cultural pluralism and cultural diversity of Muslims as a majority versus predominant ethnic minorities. So taken above background into consideration, the purpose of my research is to examine Chinese Muslim intellectuals point of view towards religious living in a secular milieu, especially during the 20th century. And uh, my research is uh, from the perspective of balancing Islam with Chinese nationalism too. Since this kind of um, question, this kind of research um, question could be achieved by looking at how Chinese Muslims ex explain and construct the meaning of Wuma. My research will be conducted through a comparative study on two well-known intellectuals we, who are called Wang Jingzhai and Ma Jian, and also about their translations of Quran. These were the most representative literature works to point to the dynamical trend of thoughts at that time. For instance, in Quran, um, Wuma together with its plural um, forms appeared 54 times, and um, Wang had translated into nation for 32 times in the first version, 10 times in the second version, but only four times in the third version while Ma had translated Wen Ma into nation for 37 times, which is more than a half out of all. Thus, generally speaking, it could be concluded that the opinion Wen Ma is identical to the norm nation in Chinese context is most accepted by Ma rather than Wang. What's more, both these two intellectuals have acknowledged that um, Muslims uh, were roughly divided into two. The pious ones living with street obligations and those who only named themselves about Muslims being restricted to nothing. And taking this phenomenon as a starting point, it could be told from Wang Jingzhai's um, translation of, of Quran that to him, Wuma only possesses religious meaning. Thus the media Wang was in the media admitting nation often as a norm for Chinese nationalism ideology has inclined him to avoid translating Wenma into nation. Meanwhile, the foreword of Wang's second version of translation and his published essays have shown that he also valued the identity as a Chinese, as every Muslim in China does. In a word, Wang claimed that in terms of Muslims, to love one's state is as important as to confirm the connection with Wuma, while indicating that they are not exactly the same. And on the other hand, from Ma Jian's translation, it's found that he inherited Wang's trend of thought and what's more had further promoted it by dropping a clear hint that Wuma equals nation. And this is consisted of both religious aspects as a Muslim and a, sec a secular aspect as a Chinese, which interpreted why there are so many nations in his translations as well. So in summary, the concept Wuma originally equated to a common community 
is reproduced and reconstructed by a number of intellectuals afterwards. And just as uh, what you can see from this slide, um, one, uh, to one's acknowledge, Wuma only refers to the religious side. Wuma only refers to the religious side and uh, to Ma Jian's, as far as Ma Jian's concerned, Wuma refers both um, religious side, religious community and Islamic community. And he also indicates that they are not exactly the same. And also both these two uh, Muslim intellectuals agree that um, to maintain one's identity, one needs to be connected to Wuma as well. Then taken Wuma and um, how Chinese Muslims understand it as an implication and look back to the three questions I have mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. First of all, how can we react to loneliness spontaneously? Just as how Muslims living as a minority cultivate their identities, the answer may be focusing on the relation based on one's mind. Originate from where is how one opens himself to the outside view, as well as clarifies the inside interpretation. And um, based on that, with regards to the last two questions, how can we be aware of the current position in the changing media and how do we settle the identity into a harmony? I suppose a light to the fact that um, these two Chinese Muslims have had separate interpretations through one important conception in Islam, as well as developed two identities in the end. My answer for these questions would be keeping prepared for always changing circumstances. That is to say, on a premise of paying attention to the present in mind, um, when it's necessary, a brand new structure may be formed to apply to the multi-layered reality. Then eventually one is able to adjust him to the outside medias too. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for paying attention. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh for your presentation, yes, Anna Kras. Thank you very much. Okay, then now uh, we'll go to the third one. Uh, the third is Miss Hitomi Tanaka. Uh, she is uh, also in the second grade now, and uh, her title is uh, Optimal Energy Mix for Economy and CO2 Reduction in 2030 and 2050. Uh, reduction of CO2 emissions is uh, required to protect uh, our global environment. She is looking for an optimal energy mix with the goal of balancing economic activities uh, with achieving CO2 emission targets. So, uh, Ms. Tanaka, are you ready to make your presentation? Yes. So, hello, I'm Hitomi Tanaka, student of GSIS. Thank you. Uh, thank you for kind introduction, Takashima Sensei. And I appreciate everyone to give me the opportunity to be here. So uh, today I'm going to talk on optimal energy mix of optimal energy mix for economy and CO2 reduction in 2030 to 2050. First of all, I start from research goal and relations with the Anthropocene and human survivability study. The Anthropocene is an era where human activities have have great impact on the global environment. Particularly, CO2 emissions have, have a big impact on the environment. Human survivability study is a field of interdisciplinary research and practical approach to solve social problems. This research pursues the optimal energy mix in the energy sector, which contributes to significantly to CO2 emissions, taking into account of the impact of both economics and CO2 reduction. For this research, we used various knowledge such as mathematics, informatics, economics, and nuclear reactor physics. So next background knowledge of energy. There are several ways to generate electricity. Among them, there are thermal power. Thermal power plants produce CO2 by burning by burning fossil fuels, coal, liquid natural gas, LNG, oil, and etc. 
and renewable energy, hydrolysis, solar, wind power, and nuclear power are CO2 free. In Japan, more than 70%, 70 per, seven, excuse me, more than 75% of electricity was generated by fossil fuels in 2090, and only 8.6% were solar and wind power. Three important factors in future energy is hydrogen and renewable energy and next generation nuclear power. Hydrogen can be a power generation as fuel cells and as a fuel mixed with LNG. And renewable energy would be installed two times more than today in 2030. But a problem is its is power fluctuation. Nuclear energy, high temperature gas reactor, which is called HDGR, is, is hopeful because it can produce both electricity and hydrogen by using sulfur D method. So in this research, when demand is low, we produce hydrogen by HDGR and SI. While demand is high, we generate electricity by burning hydrogen with LNG. So problems in energy sector are meeting strict CO2 reduction goals and fluctuation of renewable energy. So we calculate the lowest best energy mix with the lowest cost under given condition, CO2 emission almost zero in 2050. And we install renewable energy as much as possible. And hydrogen and pumped straight hydroelectricity mitigate the fluctuation. Method. Here I explain yearly load duration curve. Load duration curve is arranged hourly power demand in descending order. Figure one is electricity demand in 2050. And the x-axis is the time expressed in time order hourly for one year. And y-axis is power. When the demand is arranged in descending order, it is figure two. And then we use this load duration curve in our analysis. And electricity demand in 2030, 2040, 2050 is assumed to be same as electricity demand in 2019. So energy planning mo model, we solve we solve with linear pro programming and we minimize the yearly cost by, cal by calculating optimal balance of power sources. And those are power sources, Co solar, wind, pumped storage, hydroelectricity, hydrolysis, coal power, liquid natural gas power, nuclear, light water reactor, and nuclear next generation, uh, high temperature gas reactor. HDGR. And the yearly cost is equals to sum of all power sources of construction cost per lifetime plus decommissioning cost per lifetime plus operation and maintenance cost plus fuel cost and etc. And conditions hydrogen is produced when the demand is low by HDDR and SI method. And hydrogen is consumed when the demand is high as fuel, fuel burned with LNG. Then we consider two scenarios. The differences, differences in, the difference in scenario one, uh, uh, CO2 emission is not regulated and the uh, model can emit any amount of CO2. In, so scenario one does not satisfy the goal to reduce CO2. But scenario two, see, scenario two, 
CO2 emission is reduced linearly to near zero by 2050. Not exactly here, not exactly zero, because if so, hydrogen cannot be a fuel with LNG. So we set the minimum amount of CO2 to produce hydrogen. Both scenario satisfies satisfy the condition that solar and wind power increases la linearly. And some of the capacity of energy sources are decommissioned and the rest can be used. In 2030, capacity remains 80% of 2090 and in 2040 uh, remain 80% of 2030. In 2050, the same. And about next generation of nuclear power in 2030, it, it is not installed because it would be underdeveloping in 2030. So we use it only in 2040 and 2050. So result. Changes, this is the change of energy mix from 2090 actual value to 2030, 2040, 2050. Those are calculated value. And the actual energy mix changed into the, this line if when scenario one and into this line in scenario two. I will explain more precisely in the next slide. We separated each energy sources to compare the ratio. And these are changes, these are changes in the ratio of energy sources of 2090, 2030, 2040, 2050. And figure one is a scenario, figure one is scenario one. And here in 2030, 45. 43% of coal are coal, 43% 40 is coal and LNG. The rate, rate of fossil fuels decreases in the future like this. This is because of the increasing solar and wind and installation of HDGR, which is costly effective. In the scenario two, thermal power sharply decreases and nuclear power sharply increases to satisfy so it to satisfy co2 emission goal nuclear should be 60% in 2030 to 2050 and generation by h2 slightly appears in 2050 here, cost and CO2 emission by two scenario. In the figure, the blue line is scenario one and the orange line is scenario two. Figure one is yearly cost. In scenario two, uh, CO2 regulation, the cost is almost always higher. And figure two is CO2 emission. In scenario two, we can satisfy the goal where CO2 emission is almost zero in 2050. In scenario one, five, five to, to thousand times much more they emit CO2 than in scenario two. So this is important part of my presentation, actually, the role of hydrogen. When highest demand, Figure one is scenario one, and there uh, LNG purple one during generates during the peak. And figure two, scenario two, H2 brown generates during the peak. And at the, at the very peak, you see that uh, solar generation, blue one, and wind generation, uh, yellow green one, is very small here. Because the peak usually appears in the evening when it gets dark and a calm 
stops the wind. So solar and wind power can't be alternative to flexible fossil fuels in the highest demand. So to, as a result, to consume hydrogen as a fuel, as a fuel covers the disadvantage of renewable energies with few CO2 emission. Discussion. So hydrogen role. In post-Anthropocene era, reduction of CO2 emission is primarily important. Renewable energies have some problems, output fluctuation and low output at highest peak. Then hydrogen can play a key role to mitigate those problems of renewable energies in the future. About nuclear energy, we saw that to meet CO2 reduction target, 60% of nuclear energy will be installed in 2030 to 2050, according to the calculation. Which, is unlike, which sounds unlikely, but we invite you to discuss the prospect of nuclear energy in post-Anthropocene era. Should we accept nuclear power for the sake of the environment, or should we abandon nuclear power to eliminate the danger associated with nuclear accidents, waste, and security? Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Mr. Naka. Okay, then uh, fourth and the last presentation is Ms. Wina Maeda. She is currently enrolled in her fifth and the final year of the GSIS. The title of the presentation is uh, A New Approach of Overseas Intensive Program Wasabi Under the COVID-19 Situation. Actually, this year, the spread of the new coronavirus uh, made it impossible to travel abroad, and uh, our GSIS overseas-related activities were also severely restricted. Under these circumstances, some of the senior students of GSIS conducted activities to provide online programs for junior students to experience a developing country. COVID-19 has imposed enormous restrictions on our society, uh, but uh, on the other hand, it has also brought about uh, new possibilities in the world of education, such as uh, distance learning. This time, she will vote on this initiative. Uh, so, Ms. Maeda, are you ready to make it? Yes. So thank you very much for kind introduction. So as Professor Takashima mentioned today, I'd like to introduce this year's achievement of our overseas internship program called Wasabi Program under this COVID-19 situation. So let me start my presentation. The experience of practical learning in different countries uh, gives us the di diverse insights. For example, when I was second grade, I went to Myanmar with my colleague as part of a GSIS curriculum, and we conducted a village survey for three weeks. Through these overseas experiences, we could realize the diverse perspectives by understanding different cultures and respect the value of each person, not only people in Myanmar, but also my colleague from different backgrounds. This three week experience was the most impressive for me in GSIS. To provide such a uh, great opportunity to other students, our group who are volunteer members of GSIS student has developed the new overseas internship program called Wasabi Program. Wasabi program was designed to conduct a survey in Dao to identify the social issue there. Through the experience in Dao, our program aims for participants to achieve the following three things. The first thing is to emphasize and respect other cultures, not only the uh, not only Laotian cultures, but also participants' own cultures. The second goal is to acquire the knowledge about the development studies. Furthermore, in Wasabi program, participants conduct a survey as a group. So to strengths, communication and teamwork capacity is the third goal. In addition, we also aim the achievement of Wasabi program will contribute to the development of Lao. 
In our original plan, after six days press survey lectures, uh, we plan to go to Laos for two weeks in September. In this original plan, we will visit Lao Jaika office and NGO, and then have an interview and workshop with Laotian students. However, due to the COVID-19, we were not able to go to Lao this year. Therefore, uh, all procedures of Wasabi program were performed online. This year, 11 graduate students with uh, different backgrounds from GSIS participated in the program, and they were divided into three groups. After press survey lectures, uh, each group set one survey topic and conducted an online survey with the cooperation of Laotian people. These are the survey topic of each team. Team one focused on the healthcare issue in Lao. The topic of team two is higher education access, especially, focus, especially focusing on the law of scholarship. The last team, team three's topic was the situation of sexual and gender minority in Lao. I will briefly share the result of each topic. Team one conducted the online survey to understand the healthcare issue in Lao with the view of health literacy, water quality, and uh, food nutrition. The result, of on, the result of their online questionnaire revealed that only 7% of respondents regard water quality as a significant problem related to their health. Although most of them have experienced, have experienced strange water taste or color. Furthermore, they found that 96% uh, of respondents consider that chemical fertilizer and uh, pesticides are at risk of disease, but only 72%, not all of them, care about it when they buy vegetables. These findings suggested that there are several gaps between their health consciousness and their life. Next. Team two revealed the, revealed the role of scholarship in the access to higher education. 54% of respondents depend on scholarships to access higher education. Among them, 67% 67 of students are low to middle income households. In addition, 87% 87% of scholarship recipients are working full-time, whereas only 47% of non-scholarship recipients are working as a full-time employee. In this study, main respondents are students from Lao Japan Institute at National Lao University. Further survey to students outside, outside LJI might confirm the crucial role of scholarship for students in Lao. Finally, Team 3 had an online survey to reveal the situation of sexual and gender minority in Lao. They found that 65% respondents are heterosexual. In other words, nearly 30% of the respondents are sexual and gender minority. 82% of them answered that they are sexual and gender minority around them, and most teenage teenagers uh, tend to have sufficient understanding about that. However, it was revealed that more than half of respondents have never learned sexual and gender minorities in school. Since there is little previous research about sexual and gender minority in Lao, this survey provided a significant result to reveal its, cu its current situation. Although uh, there were several limitations, uh, each team could obtain the sufficient survey results through our online activities. Wasabi program gave the opportunity to experience cross-cultural differences for participants even online. Based on the feedback from participants, they gave good scores for achieving our three goals. This case study suggested the potential of an online program as an alternative way of overseas internship. They also 
gave additional comment like online communication and time management were the most difficult part. The others answered that uh, the lecture about research methodology and data analysis should be enriched. Based on these comments, further improvement might help to develop the effective program to get the global insight. Finally, we thank the many people who support our program. Thanks to the kind cooperation with JICA Lao Office, uh, Lao Japan Institute at National Lao University, and Laotian students in this Meikai University and uh, uh, Lao students in University of Hyogo, we could complete this uh, Wasabi program. So this is the end of the presentation from the Wasabi teams. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Maeda. Okay, uh, that's the end of the four students' presentations. So from now on, I would like to hear a brief summary comment from the three professors of GSIS. Uh, professor will make comments in about three minutes per person. First of all, I'd like to ask Professor Yu Yuichi Ikeda. A professor Ikeda uh, specializes in data, uh, network and the computational science. Uh, so, can I ask uh, Professor Ikeda? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Kou Takashima Sensei. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Yuichi Ikeda. I'm a, a professor of physics at GSIS. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a short comment for the presentation by Ha Nakura san and uh, Tanaka san. Okay, so for the first uh, comment is for Ha Nakura san. Okay, according to a report in the Asahi Shimbun on September 27 this year, uh, pres President Xi Jinping uh, instructed to strengthen education to the Muslim minority in China to establish a correct national, historical, ethnic, cultural, and religious views. Uh, he called for the face of Uyghur and other Muslim minorities to be brought under the leadership of the Communist Party and integrated with the socialist value advocated by the party leadership. Uh, if this report is correct, if this, is, this report is correct, even if the Muslim minorities have been lifted out of poverty, the people's sense of well-being and security may not have been strengthened. Uh, I want to ask the uh, presenter, Hanakura-san, to clarify your uh, understanding of the reality of Muslim minority in today's China. Okay, this is for Hanakura-san. Okay, so the second one, second comment is for Tanaka-san. Uh, okay, so Tanaka-san pointed out the necessity of nuclear power and possibility of hydrogen based on the storage to reduce CO2 emission to zero by two, uh, 2050. The presenter, uh, Tanaka-san, shows two options at the end of her presentation. The use of nuclear power as a, a countermeasure to climate change or the rejection of the nuclear power out of the fear of potential health hazard and negative heritage for the future generation. Uh, but are there any other options other than these two options? Uh, yes, of course we have. Uh, we can consider the more flexible operation and technological innovation. If we suppress the output of solar power when there is an excess of solar power output, uh, more solar power can be installed. As a result, we can reduce CO2 emission uh, more, okay? And, and in, in addition to this, uh, the uh, 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 presentation uh, should also consider, present, uh, Tanaka-san should also consider uh, the hydrogen production using solar power, not only from uh, nuclear power, okay? That is the second one. And in addition to this, that this is the last one, uh, the introduction of uh, vehicle to grid technology. Uh, this uh, use peak parked electric vehicle as 
energy storage device. We can uh, use uh, electric vehicle as a, a, a balancing apparatus, a balancing uh, facility, balancing power to integrate more renewable energy. So I'd like to ask Tanaka-san to consider this uh, issue after this presentation. OK, thank you very much. Uh, anyway, uh, both, of, both of the presenters uh, made a significant and very impressive presentation. I'd like to express uh, their, uh, uh, thank, my thank to their uh, uh, very nice presentation. OK, thank you very much. This is my uh, comment. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much for your comment and the questions, uh, Professor uh, Ikeda. Then uh, next, I'd like to uh, ask Professor Yosuke Yamashiki. Uh, Professor Yamashiki specializes in the field of earth and the planetary science. Uh, Yamas Professor Yamashiki, please. OK. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Today, the discussion is uh, an Anthropocene and how the human impact uh, influenced the Earth's fate. And uh, in the morning session, there are so many discussions about whether can we intervene the changes that we have committed and how can we select the future. And uh, today's for presentation, I think, follow. And uh, it's an interesting topics and also in interesting approach that is ongoing from the GSC science student. So we are, of course, trying to solve the many uh, issues raised by the Anthropocene, but at the same time, the, the, some of the issues like COVID-19 was never expected. But uh, if you think about the very long history of the human race, I think that kind of the uh, pandemic has several times attacking the human civilization. And that now is a good chance to uh, reflect all the changes, right? Uh, of course, uh, I'd like to make a short comment like uh, Tanaka-san's presentation. Yeah, I think the, the theory looks very nice. Uh, my, my concern is, of course, it's uh, because I, I get the presentation from uh, Yamana Sensei, who, who is uh, a specialist in the nuclear power, and the energy mix is very important. The, 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 my only concern is how can you deal with the spent fuel and also the how can you think about the uh, uh, fission product because uh, even the uh, the technology become newer newer type of the nuclear power plant of course there are uh, spent fuel it's produced so those kind of uh, technology uh, to appropriately treat the spent fuel is for, for, from my point of view it's the most important then uh, there is a discussion whether we can admit the co2 emission uh, more than right, the current status. I, I think, of course, the CO2 em emission should also be uh, limited and also reduced. And uh, probably the human activity uh, become more and more. There are so many uh, issues and uh, uh, potential solution that could be raised from our side also uh, become uh, sometimes it's a limited and not appropriate. But uh, this kind of struggle by proposing a new uh, uh, idea uh, among the, the very complex system and using our resources is very, very important. And in that sense, I think the student is trying to uh, make the uh, solution in that Anthrop Anthropocene era. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your comment and the questions, uh, uh, Professor Yamashiki. Then uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Kaoru Sekiyama. Uh, Professor Sekiyama specializes in the field of uh, psychology of lifespan uh, development and uh, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, Professor Sekiyama, please. Hi, uh, thank you for this opportunity to make some comments today. Um, so from the stimulating talks in the morning and the early uh, afternoon, we have learned that the scope of post-anthropocene is quite broad. And uh, I wonder, uh, one thing I didn't understand is uh, when is the post-anthropocene? <laughs> so maybe someone uh, tell me uh, sometime during this uh, discussion. And my questions to each pres student's presenters, uh, very short ones, uh, for Thiago Kuhn. 
uh, your results of categorizing the content of the patents are quite interesting, and such as a prevention and treatment and so on. So I also noticed that various countries took various time for analysis. And for example, United States took a very long time on average. So I wonder why it was the case. Okay, and for Hassan, uh, I think Uma people have um, uh, culturally their own identity. So it is now good for their well-being, I guess. And it is my understanding right? And I also have a naive question about Uma people's future. So will they still exist as a group at post-Anthropocene period? And for Tanaka-san, uh, you have drawn a, con so seemingly you have drawn a conclusion uh, based on your computation that the nuclear power will be necessary in 2050. But however, you also um, showed that the uh, development of a hydrogen energy may be a um, key uh, uh, factor to change the situation. Oh, is my understanding right? So that's my question. And for uh, Maeda-san, I'm very glad to know that there are a group of students in our stu school who cooperate to assist learning activities of junior students. And moreover, knowing other country uh, culture is very important to have an appropriate view of the world. So I hope these activities will continue. Uh, and one question about the, your presentation is, uh, how did you conduct the online survey and what kind of people answered the survey? Yeah, that's my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your questions and comments, uh, Professor Sekiyama. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, you, the older three uh, professors made uh, a good point of uh, comments and the questions, and perhaps it is better to take a time to uh, exchange the views uh, from the presenters. But uh, unfortunately, we already passed the scheduled time, so and. Uh, uh, maybe we can have uh, another occasion to discuss uh, within this uh, school. So, uh, the all the present, uh, oh no, all the all the participants are from the uh, outside. If you have any questions, I can take one or two uh, from the outside. If not, uh, yeah, due to that time constraint, I'd like to uh, close this uh, third session. So, uh, how about the uh, all the viewers? Uh, participants, is there any comments or questions? If you have, please uh, write uh, your point in the chat box. Maybe, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Maybe uh, all of you uh, respect our time uh, management. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much all the uh, presenters and the commentators uh, in this uh, sessions. And thank you very much for all the people uh, viewing from the our webinar from outside. Actually, thank you very much.